During the past couple of weeks, we've looked at some of the Psalms, and we will continue this theme in the following weeks. The book of Psalms, or to put it more accurately, the five books of Psalms, which are grouped together in one book, may well be found in the pages of the Old Testament, but in each of them we we will find that they point us to the glory of the gospel. The gospel is the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, and there are messages of hope, of peace, but also of warning and reprimand for God's people in the Psalms. And today we look at Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. This psalm contrasts the two different paths of mankind's journey through life, and it highlights the distinctions which we find between the two types of people and the opposing paths that they're on. It speaks of the wicked and it speaks of the righteous. Now, firstly, as Christians, we must always remember that the righteousness we share in is a gift of grace from God. We are clothed in the righteousness of Christ as he took on the burden of our sin. This this great exchange which took place as our sin is imputed to Jesus and his righteousness is imputed to us is the very essence of the gospel. It is the good news of what God has done for us by his act of mercy and of grace. And as the Apostle Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 2, we have not achieved any righteousness through our own efforts. He writes, it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. We are saved by the mercy and the grace of God. So while the first psalm lists some of the characteristics and fruit of a saved life, we must bear in mind that these things are the result of God's grace and of Jesus' work of redemption on the cross. So any changes which we see and experience in our lives are a gift from God. They are not the result of our own efforts to be a better person. But in just the first two verses of the psalm, we see just how dramatic and radical these changes are. Blessed is the man. The New New Living Translation says, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked. There really is an inner joy for the Christian when you find the direction of your life redirected towards God's glory instead of the pursuit of your own desires and happiness. Verse 1, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. There's so much in just this verse alone. It speaks of this natural separation which now comes between the righteous and the wicked. As the Spirit of God convicts the hearts of the redeemed, you will find yourself slowly but surely moving away from the old habits and the old lifestyle which once seemed so attractive. But, and this is important, this is not about having a holier-than-thou attitude. It's so important that we understand this because unfortunately many Christians just don't get it right and we can justifiably be tagged with this unfortunate label of holier-than-thou. Instead, as believers, we now begin a spirit-guided journey as God leads us down the path of truth and righteousness, as opposed to the path of destruction that our old souls were once on. Amos chapter 3 verse 3 says, Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? What this means is that believers are of a like mind, and as God changes the desires of our hearts, we will find the old life less and less attractive. Now, does this mean that we are to cut ourselves off from our non-believing friends and family? Of course not. 
we are to be salt and light in the world, and we cannot do that by arrogantly rejecting them completely. That's being holier than thou. And that kind of attitude doesn't help anyone, least of all those to whom we are to witness. What it does mean is realizing that not walking in the counsel of the wicked, standing in the way of sinners, or sitting in the seat of scoffers is grasping this whole idea that while we remain in the world, we are not of the world. The Apostle Paul quotes from Isaiah chapter 52 when he writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, starting at verse 17. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. And touch no unclean thing, then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. The point is that when we choose to follow Christ, we have to understand that we will need to make some difficult decisions. You cannot submit to Christ and not be changed. There, there simply has to be visible fruit of the new birth. But again, I must emphasize that this is not about thinking that we are better than anyone else. But God takes our commitment to him, to him very seriously, certainly a lot more seriously than we do. James 4 verse 4 says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. But as verses 2 and 3 say, The righteous man's delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The way that the Christian grows and prospers, spiritually, not materially, is by delighting in God and in his word. And if you are beginning to find yourself being burdened by the demands of what the scriptures require of you, Ask God to fill you with a desire to please him. Ask him to give you a sense of joy as you find out what gives him joy first. This is what the Apostle Paul meant when he wrote in Philippians chapter 2 that we are to work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. Now this is not about working for our salvation. Instead it's a question of now that I am saved, how do I live a life which pleases God rather than myself? So how do we live a life that pleases him? Let's have a look at the example of Joshua. Joshua was given the, the daunting task of taking over the leadership of the Israelite nation from Moses. And in his first address to them in chapter 1, he says, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous. And then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. This was Joshua's inaugural speech as their new leader. As the leader of God's people. And what's the very first thing he does? He points them to God and his laws. Modern politicians could certainly learn a thing or two by studying the Bible. Joshua was very clear, if you want to please God and be prosperous and successful spiritually, obey the word. And nothing has changed in our day. We are to be students of the word. Jesus says in John chapter 15, in verse 5 and in verse 8, Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. In the previous chapter, in chapter 14, Jesus tells them very plainly, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That verse alone can be very daunting for the Christian, because we don't need to be reminded that while we are saved, we still fall into sin. So when you read, if you love me, you will obey my commandments, you can almost sense the universal response in the church is, yes, but how? We want to obey Christ. We want to do all these things which please God. But just how do we do it? 
And Jesus has the answer in the very next verses in John chapter 14. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, this is something we looked at last week. We need to surrender to the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. By God's grace and with his help, he will guide us down this new path that we have chosen to walk, this new path which is not the way of the wicked. I wonder if Paul had the words of Psalm 1 in mind when he wrote the following in Colossians chapter 3. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's, ho as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness and patience, bearing with one another. If one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you were called, to which you indeed were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. As Paul does here, so does Psalm 1 warn us of the alternative for those who choose not to turn to Jesus Christ in repentance. Those who remain in the way of the wicked. Verses 4 to 6 in Psalm 1 says, The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Those who believe are saved. This is what the gospel promises. But those who reject Christ are already condemned. In Jesus' conversation with Nicodemus, just after the wonderful promise that we know so well in John 3 verse 16, Jesus describes the condition of those who remain in the counsel of the wicked, who stand in the way of sinners, and who sit in the seat of scoffers. He says, whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. The words of Psalm 1 are so encouraging for those who are in Christ, those who have been clothed in his righteousness. But there is also a severe warning for those who reject the grace of God. Remember, this is not about us. It is about God's glory and the call for his redeemed children to live for him and no longer for ourselves. We are in the world until such time as God calls us home or Jesus returns. And we are in the world for a purpose, to live for him. We are in the world but not of the world because we no longer walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of scoffers. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. God bless you.